And welcome everybody to the last plenary session. Thanks for making it this far. There's still enough of you that hopefully we can have a really great debate on this. So as Alex mentioned, I'm a researcher with the Humanitarian Innovation Project. I've been with the project since we started in 2012, and I'm really excited to be part of this final session, which hopefully can bring together some of the ideas that you have been thinking about in your sessions for the last two days. So, as Alex mentioned, we've got the opportunity to debate here the role of technology and question what benefits it can really be leveraged for communities affected by humanitarian crises. So, in the humanitarian space, technology, of course, is a hot topic. Um, in a panel yesterday, in fact, Oisin from the Vodafone Foundation said it quite nicely that when you speak to people about innovation, nine times out of ten, people really only think about products and technology. And that's sort of true in the humanitarian space as well. We've seen really exciting technologies being developed, digital cash transfer, drones or 3D printing, for example. They all do offer great potential for improved effectiveness in the delivery of aid. Yet, there are also potential risks and ethical challenges when we think about implementing these technologies in practice. And I also liked on the same panel yesterday, Jackie from the UNHCR innovation team said that in the humanitarian sector, she does believe that we've moved on from thinking that technology is a neutral product. And actually, if you build it, we won't necessarily lead to success. So these two kind of counter ideas, I really want to try and unpack. And we're really fortunate enough to have today with us, as Alex mentioned, a really diverse set of perspectives on the topic. And first of all, at the end, I'd like to introduce Pascal Dordain, who is the head of the policy unit at the International Committee um, of the Red Cross. We next have Tom Scott Smith, who is a lecturer at the School of Sociology, Politics and International Studies at the University of Bristol, but who will be joining us next year at the Refugee Studies Centre. And finally, Patrick Meyer, who is the Director of the Social Innovation at the Qatar Computing Research Institute. And some of you might know Patrick for his recent publication on digital humanitarians. So I'll first invite you all just to introduce yourselves briefly. And I've got some interesting questions just to pick your thoughts a little bit further. And then we'll turn to you all to continue the discussion and ask some questions that you might have thought about in the last two days. So Pascal, would you like to go first? Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, as you said, I'm the... Uh senior uh, advisor on, on policy issue for the RCRC, so uh, technology or innovation is just part of my portfolio. We, we deal with all sorts of, of human policies. Uh, I started, uh, I would say, a couple of years ago uh, for the RCRC in the field, uh, mainly in Afghanistan, uh, in, the, in Central Asia, in, in, in the Middle East, uh, then specialized in protection issues and protection activities. Uh, then I, I, I spent 10 years outside SCRC, uh, I would say in the security sector, in the dark, for the dark side of the force, uh, and uh, probably seeking some form, form of redemption. Uh, I came back in 2011 to the SCRC as, uh, in, in the policy sector and still there. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, these days there are a lot of uh, opportunities to get excited, thrilled by the evolution of the sector and the re revolution which, which is taking place uh, uh, these days. Great, thank you very much. Tom? Um, yes, thanks very much. I work um, at the University of Bristol and what I wanted to do today was bring a historical perspective um, to this issue of humanitarian technology because I've written on um, the way that humanitarians uh, provide aid in different ways in very different historical eras. And I want to offer a, a, a kind of note of caution, a, a counterweight to the, to the techno-optimism that I see today. Um, and I just thought I'd use this chance to just tell you a little bit about the kind of research that I've done so far. And in very broad terms, what I look at is the way that humanitarians have responded to very basic needs like food and shelter, and the way that the response to these needs has changed over time. Um, and we all know that humanitarian aid has a very long history. We all know it goes back to the mid-19th century. Um, and having immersed myself in this history for several years, the most obvious thing that I'd say is that the turn to technology is nothing new. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself and my work by giving a very quick example of a technology from the 1790s, um, which is at the very, very birth of humanitarian uh, act activities. 
And it comes from a famous philanthropist called Count Rumford, who began manufacturing this ingenious and enormous soup digester. Um, it was this series of huge vats that were connected by pipes, and in it you could boil a, a cow and a barrel full of vegetables into thousands of bowls of soup in record time. And the reason I think this is quite a good example to compare is because the soup kitchen was the basic model of relief in that period, and this piece of technology was received extremely enthusiastically as something that improved the efficiency of the soup kitchen. It made making that soup much more efficient. But it wasn't really a genuinely transformative technology, and I think, for me, that's quite important. It didn't actually change the soup kitchen itself, it just made the soup kitchen more efficient. And the humanitarians were still left with the paternalism, with this very uncomfortable distinction between deserving and undeserving poor, with the fundamentally meagre diets, with this barely suppressed violence that you saw in the soup kitchen. And I'm telling you this really because I think we need to think about what transformation really, really means in this context. Um, the efficiency of the soup kitchen may have been transformed by this thing, but it was still basically a soup kitchen. Um, and the, the, the role that technology plays um, in humanitarian aid is an important thing to consider when we think about the past. But I'll give some more examples later. Great, well. thanks very much. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll keep it short. I've been working in the humanitarian technology space for about 10 years. I'm really interested in how new emerging technologies can potentially be harnessed to improve uh, humanitarian action and addressing all the challenges that come uh, with undefined new spaces. It's part of the fun. I think I'm being set up here, by the way, as a, on the panel as a cyber <laughs> utopian. I might disappoint. I'm feeling a little tired and jaded, but we'll get into that in a bit. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. So Patrick, let's start there with my first provocative question to see how far you can be pushed. Um, as I mentioned, you recently authored um, the book called Digital Humanitarians, which talks about maybe the transformative potential of merging technologies and social movements around that. Um, so can you tell us why you think that technology has the potential to fundamentally improve humanitarian response. Thank you. I wanted to also say thank you to Alex and, uh, for inviting me. Really great to be here. I, um, and thank you for reviewing endorsing my book and Dennis King as well and a few others in this room. So thank you very much for, for your support. I have to say it's, it's unfortunate. Well, I, I just arrived. So I've, I've missed 95% of the conference. And here we are supposed to bring it all back together and make it sense. And, and, and like it's deliberate and so on. So unfortunately, I don't have that. My, my excuse is that I was just running a a three-day uh, policy forum on, on UAVs in the humanitarian space. And I'll, I'll touch on that maybe a little later during the panel because that's going to be very much focused on the innovation in terms of processes rather than technology. And I really want to get some of those ideas out. You're the first to get the debrief on this um, and to get your input. But so I would say, um, you know, to address this question, potential of technology to, 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 to change, improve humanitarian uh, action, I'll, I'll answer it through three points. Uh, the first is really a thought experiment, very simple, nothing revolutionary. Um, the second is about mega trends, and I'll pick on one. I think we're, by the, I, I'm tired, so I'm maybe speaking a little more openly than I usually am, but uh, I think we suck at understanding what mega trends are, and we don't know what's hit us until it's 10 years later, um, but I'll expand on that. And then the third is to ask a question that is bound to get me into trouble, or at least the answer of the question that I'm going to pose. It's going to get me in trouble, so hopefully you can prove me wrong and, uh, and get me out of trouble. But in the first one, the thought experiment, I was just thinking on the way over, uh, you know, exact, almost exactly three years today, on July 23rd, uh, 2012, uh, the planet, our civilization, narrowly escaped um, probably the most um, disastrous, catastrophic um, disaster that we've ever experienced. Namely, there was a huge uh, solar eruption. Uh, on the sun and major solar uh, flares, bigger than I think has been recorded in, in human history. And if we had been in the direct uh, path of those solar flares, according to NASA scientists who are the believable kind, um, we would have been, you know, back in the dark ages. That's their term, dark ages. Um, communication infrastructure globally, fried. GPS, fried. Anything plugged into a socket, fried, right? So I was just thinking about that, and, and if that had happened, and thinking about the role that technology can, could play. You know, if we had no phones, no radio, no television, no smartphones, no internet, no satellites, would our humanitarian response efforts have been improved in this particular hypothetical, not so hypothetical environment, right? Would we have been able to respond faster? Would we have been able to respond in a more coordinated way, in a more targeted way, in a more, um, 
efficient way. I seriously, seriously doubt it, right? And the reason I'm bringing this up is to perhaps suggest that technology has already transformed the humanitarian. It is transforming and it continues to transform the humanitarian space. So I would find it particularly hard to stand up and say, well, yes, that technology has transformed us, but any new technologies that come after that, nah, it's not really going to have any impact on innovation, on processes. In fact, we might as well ignore the upcoming field of disaster ro of robotics because it's not going to have any impact. So I think it's just, I'm, I'm making an extreme in, uh, example just because it, it's already had a transformative, uh, transformative impact. Has it reached its full potential? No, have all the processes been in place to ensure that we really maximize this and do this well with do no harm? Absolutely not, but it still had, it's had an impact whether we like it or not. On the second point of the mega trends, I think it's a democratization, which is a big word, um, of technology, and in particular information communication technology that I'm particularly interested in. And, and why is democratization important? Well, because I'd like to think that, disaster, that first responders are very much the disaster-affected communities, um, and that they've kind of been the first responders for a long, long time. You're more likely to survive because of local resources and local agency than external resources and, and agency. We've seen this in disaster studies and disaster sociology studies and so on. So self-organization and mutual help, self-help, mutual aid, I think has been one of the most powerful uh, examples of humanitarian action for hundreds and hundreds of years. Distributed, self-organized, hyper-local, uh, mutual aid. Now imagine if those communities are no longer in the dark ages and they can do self-help and mutual aid with a little help from telephones, from radios, from SMS, from social media even. Surely that gives the affordance, the opportunity of potentially self-organizing faster, potentially self-organizing a little better, perhaps having more informed, more timely information to, to basically help each other out. So with that picture, if we look now at the latest statistics, for example, from the latest uh, Ericsson mobility report, which I highly encourage if anybody here is really interested in the technology and megatrends, uh, that just came out a few weeks ago, uh, which basically says in January, February, and March of this year, just three months of 2015, um, has seen uh, 108 million mobile phone subscribers, new mobile phone subscribers, 108 million in January, February, and March. Let's put this in pr into perspective. Let's take the populations of Australia, of Canada, and you've, uh, of Uganda. You take that population, you combine it, that's about 100 million. So the equivalent here is to say that, imagine that Australia, Uganda, and Canada on January 1st of this year, nobody in those three countries had cell phones. By March 31st, everybody in Uganda, in Canada, and Australia had cell phones. That's what we're talking about in terms of the rapid pace of uh, technology and dissemination and so on. When you think and you look at these numbers, I, I saw a couple of months ago in The Economist a reference to uh, they were quoting another statistic saying that uh, within the next 48 months, um, about 80% of the world's adult population will have access to a smartphone. Within the next 48 months. So I'm hopeful that this technology uh, explosion, like we've never seen in, the, in, in our history, is going to enable and afford more self-organized action and self-help and mutual aid. I think that could be uh, very, very powerful, and we've already seen it. We're seeing it in Kathmandu after the Nepal earthquake with local communities self-organizing with new technologies. We've seen it in, in the Philippines and in Indonesia. We're seeing it all across the board. And I, I think with these numbers, I think we're going to see uh, more and more. The third one is a, is a, is a question that's going to get me into trouble. Um, is, is the emperor wearing any clothes? And, and by that, I, 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 let me see if um, I can explain what I have in my, I've been struggling with. So in a recent disaster, the humanitarian community puts together assessments in order to feed into the flash appeal, right? And here I was, I was observing all this, and a uh, lot of, frankly, guesswork, if that, is going into the assessment of just how much money is going to be needed to recover from this disaster. And this number, this magical number, uh, gets basically submitted to the executive leadership of the United Nations, which comes back a day later saying, no, 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 actually, can you please revise the number because donors are only going to cough up between this and this range, right? So it's a political number. You can do all the assessments you bloody want. You can use the most advanced new technologies you have. 
it's still a political number. It's going to be decided politically, regardless of how many people are in need, regardless of how much help is, is required, how much rebuilding. It was purely political. So that's one part. The, and the reason I'm, I'm bringing this emperor's clothes is because this is another app impact that I'm seeing in terms of technology on the humanitarian sector. It's making me think that the humanitarian sector is not wearing any, any clothes. And let me expand a bit on that and then I'll, 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 I'll hopefully get some therapy from all of you and you tell me how to do this better. But another thing that's really blown my mind is by looking at these new technologies that are new data sources of information, you know, we in the humanitarian technology, digital humanitarian space have been excited by the potential of these new data sources as com complementary to traditional data sources. So what we've been doing is we've been thinking, okay, let's talk to these professionals who are doing disaster damage assessments and better understand how they do that with traditional data sets so that we can have a better understanding as to how these new unorthodox sources of data might help inform, might help complement, might help augment uh, disaster damage assessments, for example. Well, frankly, having been doing this for the past five years, I've just come to the conclusion that the methodologies used by humanitarian organizations to assess disaster damage and needs suck. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm appalled at the, 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 the methodologies and the processes being, the, and we're talking about processes being important for innovation. We have some processes here, but they suck. Let me give you an example. One leading international organization that does disaster damage assessments, very global, international, um, often does disaster damage assessments in terms of buildings and shelters and so on. And the way that they do this is by identifying which buildings have been fully destroyed versus which buildings have been partially destroyed, partially damaged but repairable, versus not destroyed, right? Now, when I asked, you know, how do you define these categories, they said, well, for partially damaged, you know, this means that 40% of a building, shelter, or house has to be 40% damaged. What the heck does that mean, right? You tell, and when I asked, in fact, it was very refreshing because this wonderful engineer who's been doing this for decades said, you know, Patrick, I don't know what that means. Frankly, when we give these field surveys and these questionnaires to our engineering experts who go out and do these assessments, we can take the best five engineers we have, we're going to get five answers back. And I've only discovered this in the context of trying to identify how aerial imagery might help complement these disaster damage assessments. So in order to do that, I need to know, what are you, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a building that is 40% damaged? What does that mean? I need to know what that means in order to go to the aerial imagery and identify which buildings actually fit that category. I mean, it's incredibly, incredibly poor. And frankly, most of the other kind of disaster damage assessments methodologies I've seen there are purely based on convenience sampling. It's not representative. And another disaster that happened recently in the past six months, about 30, 40 percent of the field-based surveys that were carried out, and I was on site, were chucked out the window because they were completely unusable because of data quality issues. These are traditional field-based surveys, 35 percent completely useless. So we can talk about new technologies, we can talk about artificial intelligence, we can talk about drones, but until we address the completely dysfunctional decision-making structures and methodologies and processes of the humanitarian sector, nothing's going to change. Absolutely nothing. Great. Thank you so much, um, Patrick. That was a really great start. And yeah, I really like the way you're saying that technology is there, it is transformative, but the benefits can't get through and can't get beyond this wall that the humanitarian space is creating for itself. So Tom, kind of picking up on that, I know yeah, your work has looked a lot at this historical aspect of technology and probably touches on some of these political issues. Um, but maybe you could elaborate a bit more on you know, the risk and some of the ethics and challenges that have gone on in the research that you've done. Yeah, and um, for me, what's interesting about using history to look at technology is that it's easy to be dismissive of the kind of assumptions that people in the past came to a technological problem with. And I'll give you an example of that, first of all. Um, and I think that when we were thinking about how transformative technology is going to be today, it can be quite instructive to think about how historians might look back on our era in 50 years or 100 years' time, how they might question the kind of assumptions that we make about humans and what they need. Um, I thought I'd tell you about two historical examples to give you a sense of what some of the risks might be from the past. And I also want to say, uh, as a cautionary note, that you feel you've been set up, I thought I was being set up here, actually, as, as the techno-pessimist, which is a bit of a simplistic way of putting 
my viewpoint forward. But I am going to tell you a very pessimistic story to start off. Um, and it's probably the most unfortunate innovation that I came across in my research, and it comes from just after the Second World War. It was this product called protein hydrolysate, and in essence it was a watery mix of milk proteins and barely digested beef, which was meant to be um, either drunk or injected straight into the bloodstreams of starving people. And it was given in Belsen um, after the liberation of the camp in 1945. And the reason I think it's so interesting is because at the time it was based on very solid logic. Um, the basic nutritional requirements of the body had only been agreed um, between international nutritionists about a decade before then. And aid workers were rushing to put this new scientific knowledge to good use. And in a way, it made sense because they realized that foods were made up of nutrients. So rather than thinking about the foods that they would give people, they thought that they would isolate the nutrients and give people the nutrients instead. And they also knew that hungry people were made up of cells which needed nutrients. So rather than thinking about fully cultured human beings, they thought just about the cells and the nutrients that those cells needed. Um, so the result was really catastrophic, and it, it's very easy to dismiss it. But what it really meant was isolating these nutrients in a hydrolyzed form and injecting it straight into the bloodstream of uh, these Holocaust victims. And of course, the procedure was very invasive. People struggled. Many of them died. Um, and it's one of the most uh, uh, d distressing stories that I, that I found. But the reason I think it's interesting is because it makes us think about what assumptions we start with and what we're missing out, what we're focusing on and what we're losing. And in terms of what can be relevant today, I wanted to highlight five risks that um, would come from my historical research. The first one is overcomplication. So I think that by focusing too much on technology, very often we can make things more complex than they need to be, and we can ignore the simplest and most straightforward solutions. The second one is what I would call a neophilia, which is falling in love with technology just because it's new, and failing to recognize that older approaches might actually work just as well. The third risk is triumphalism, which is being overexcited about wizardry and overstating the benefits of a product that actually does very little to, to change the underlying circumstances that people are living in. The fourth risk is underrepresentation, um, which essentially means that you forget to involve people, and I think we're all aware of this as being one of the main risks of technology. And then the fifth one is what I've called in one paper fetishization, which is really when you have a new tool, you tend to worship it and become overly enamored with it and use it in far too many circumstances. I think it's sometimes known as the law of the instrument, which is that if all you have is a hammer, you tend to treat everything like a nail. And um, I have an example from the 1970s which I think illustrates all five of these problems coming together. And it's, a, again, a cautionary tale rather than one that's representative of aid in the 70s. And it's this product called leaf protein concentrate, which was made from ordinary grass and green leaves which were boiled up in a huge vat of water. The protein from the leaves was allowed to coagulate on the surface of the water, and then it was skimmed off and dried into a powder which could be sprinkled on meals to improve their nutritional profile. And there was a lot of optimism about this product in the 1970s, and again, you can see why. It's this wonderful, modernist, scientific vision of producing food from the grass and the green leaves that are all around us and converting it into something that can be used um, in, in a humanitarian situation. But it fell into all five of those traps that I just outlined. Firstly, it was too complex. This process involved a hell of a lot of energy and time, all this preparing and boiling and skimming of the leaves. Um, and although it worked as a protein supplement, it diverted attention from what was a much simpler solution, which was to grow more beans um, and lentils, which could be added to the diet for protein uses as well. And the second problem was that it, was, um, it suffered from this form of neophilia, this obsession with novelty. Aid workers tend to love it because it was new, and this was an era that was shaped by the attraction of new technologies. It was Harold Wilson's era of the great white heat of technology. And the third problem um, was that it was triumphalist. It lost sight in many ways of how awful things were for the people it was trying to assist. Again, the idea was fine, that if you sprinkled something onto a very poor diet, you could improve its nutritional profile. But for me, there's a real irony in this example, that it was using all the powers of modern technology to produce something that was very modest 
essentially a marginal improvement to a gruel, to a very poor diet. People would sprinkle it over their starchy porridges or their main meal to, to, to boost them. Um, and it, it really made an unacceptable meal a little bit more acceptable, but there was a, a lot of triumphalism about it and about how it was going to transform the lives of the poor and it was going to solve malnutrition. And this is a real danger when ultimately people are still eating gruel, it's just a slightly more nu nutritionally acceptable gruel. And um, the fourth problem that I mentioned that this one also suffered from was a crisis of representation. It, it didn't involve people, it didn't talk to people. Uh, the project workers never asked the end users what they wanted, and if they had, they would have learned quite quickly that people didn't want a product to sprinkle on meals, they wanted a better diet, and that they had their own ideas. And this is a wider issue in humanitarian technology, um, but I've always thought it's useful to say whether it's ever possible to have innovation without representation. If you innovate, you need to have people represented on the committees or in the involvement in the design. And even though this is well recognised, of course, by many people involved in the sector, it does still slip through. And then the final problem was what I called fetishism. This fell into the trap of placing too much faith in the concrete material object itself and not enough in the softer human-centred side, the human-centred processes. Um, so I think that's quite an instructive example, and those are five risks that, that in that circumstance, all came together, um, so it's quite a good example. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. So we've had some quite critical perspectives, so Pascal, maybe you can tell us how this makes sense and what it means for an organisation like ICRT. Okay. Um, I, I, will, <coughs> I hope they will sound a, least, a little bit less ludite than you are. <laughs> uh, but... Well, <laughs> I think we are more or less on the same side. Uh, I think in, in terms of innovation, we, we should also distinguish between progress and in innovation. You know, Oppenheimer was uh, an innovator. Uh, I'm not sure he was, uh, you know, b uh, bringing advancement of, 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 of humanity. So I think, I think we have to always to, to look at the two sides or the two faces of, 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 of innovation and, 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 and new technologies. It sounds a cliche, but I think uh, because we are engaged into you mentioned uh, actions, we, we tend to think that uh, everything we do is is, is positive and, and, and relevant. Uh, for us in in our CRC, uh, we have a <clears throat> an additional problem because we deal uh, mainly with conflicts, and conflicts are uh, you know a combination of malevolent intentional harm uh, and physical Im impact. So you can't solve all the problems through technology, uh, by definition. When I hear, for example, that uh, people say, okay, to prevent uh, uh, women collecting woods uh, outside the camp, so we'll, uh, uh, you know, provide them with uh, uh, fuel-efficient stoves, uh, I'm not sure we are uh, reaching the right solution because it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, respond to the protection problem. So I, th I think if we are happy with that kind of solution, we may end up with distributing flag jacket to all the civilians which are uh, shot at in, 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 in the streets of, 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 of Alep. So I think that's, that's important that we, we keep a, a kind of moral compass and, and design relevant uh, solution. In conflict situation, it's always a mixture of, of social solutions, political solutions, human solutions and technological uh, 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 solutions, but, but not uh, solving all the problems through uh, uh, the wizardry of, of and, 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 and gadgets, which uh, may, <coughs> you know, uh, create the illusion that you have solved the problem. Uh, <coughs> Do, do we need to innovate? Of course, uh, I guess uh, we have innovated all, all over the years. It, it didn't start three years ago, four years ago, when the, the word uh, you know, circulated. Uh, we have innovated uh, to be more efficient, uh, to be more relevant, but also for a, a very simple reasons, because all views of vulnerabilities, all views of human action have, has changed and will change. You know, what we consider as relevant today just, uh, moral, etc., will evolve. When I started in a uh, couple of years ago in Afghanistan, we had basically two types of activities. Uh, an hospital for war wounded and uh, protection activities. You know, health, for example, the notion of health was not on the table. We, we didn't, you know, care about that. You know, we, we didn't see the systemic effects of a conflict at that time. So we had to innovate and, and because we, we want to be more relevant and we 
or understanding of the, of the dynamic of conflict evolve, uh, uh, you know, and, and of course the situation as well evolved. The, 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 the conflict in, in Syria and Iraq is nothing to do with the ones uh, we had in Salvador. So uh, we have to innovate as well in terms of not only technological uh, wizardry, but also in terms of methodology processes. Uh, in the past, uh, we had direct contact with, uh, oh no, easy contact with uh, non-state actors. Then we started to uh, have contacts uh, through a prisons visit because their leadership was in prisons and we could establish you know, connections. Now with elusive uh, movements like Boko Haram, Daesh, it's far more complicated and we have not reached you know, the, the, still the solutions to, to, to get them. So we have to find new ways, new, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, new strategies uh, to establish a dialogue uh, and, and, and trying to convince these people to, to respect uh, their, their obligations. So, um, uh, innovation for us concerns also the dialogue with authorities, humanitarian diplomacy, uh, strategic of, strategy of, uh, of influence, uh, protection activities, communication, etc. It, it, it's uh, the technological part is probably uh, just one, one uh, example. Um, and if I, I can <coughs> uh, just uh, I was rather fascinated by what, what you say about the, the, the risk. I think uh, technology, the technology may have a, a direct effect on, on operator, operating model. Uh, the notion of access, uh, we may, uh, and I would say wrongly, try to substitute physical access with remote uh, management. Uh, we end up with something like dematerialization of aid, you know, cash transfer is, is, is not a truck with uh, distributing food, it's something else. It changed also the, the or ethos or the, the views, uh, the perception uh, we, we may uh, project. Uh, um, the, the notion of sustainability, we may find, uh, uh, you know, technology which promotes sustainability. Uh, we need to have a mitigation of risk, uh, do no harm, but, but uh, risk on short term, risk on, on, on long term. Uh, so all this, all this risk um, uh, have to be uh, taken into account, like, you know, the increasing dependency, increasing vulnerability, uh, uh, um, addressing uh, legal issues, uh, etc., etc. So it's a, it's a new, uh, I would say it's a new field, it's uncharted waters, and for, for this we need a, a, a strong uh, moral compass, and that's also the work which has been done by Alexander Brett uh, here in, in, in this uh, very university, is really to charter the water and, and just not to lose our, our, I would say our soul uh, in, in, in the course of innovation, but really to, to be ready to change the way we operate, but at the same time keep the same moral compass because it's our identity, as, uh, after all, and um, um, human action is not about the what only, and that, that's what, what I'm, I'm hearing uh, a, a bit too often in these corridors. You know, if the notion of efficiency, the notion, the notion, of, the notion of, of of efficacy as, uh, is, is is important, but human action is about it's about relationship. It's about getting in touch with people uh, who are suffering, who have needs and aspirations, and uh, we should not fall into some something like solutionism, you know, which is co corresponds to what you said, which is you know disaggregate uh, uh, problems in, into needs, you know. Uh, so uh, you have an education problem, a nutrition problem, an hygiene problem, a sanitation problem. Uh, uh, we tend to to uh, to lose you know, the big picture somehow and not to uh, address the problem in a systemic way. So we have to be careful that just to, because we have technologies, we, we would say like the hammer and the nail, uh, let's, let's uh, disaggregate it, uh, this, this uh, issue in, into small problems or small needs and then we will uh, be able to, 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 to respond accordingly. That, that's also uh, one of the problem I think which is uh, rather looming in, in, in these days is this notion of solutionism. You can find a solution for everything. It's kind of engineer mentality, you know, let's fix it. Uh, some problems have to be managed, not fixed. And that's a bit different. There's a, there is a, I would say, slight difference between fixing problem and managing them. <clears throat> Great, thank you very much, Pascal. I'm really glad um, that we very quickly got to
to some of the really gritty issues with using technology. And there is a massive gap. And I think you've all mentioned the social elements and human aspects, and even from an organizational perspective, still trying to maintain um, some kind of human elements to um, thinking about innovation and technology. So now I'd like to maybe turn the questions to try and think about how some of these challenges can be tackled. So Patrick, do you have any good examples where um, you see the potential in a technology and what it would mean to use it in a transformative way for humanitarianism and maybe overcome some of these issues that you've already identified? Thanks. That's, that's, it's good to also focus on, on what can we do about it. It's one thing to just, you know, um, have a fit and pout and uh, so on, but let's try and do something about it. I think I can relate it uh, in, in part to the past three days. So, um, so a, a couple, a, a year and a half ago, I founded the Humanitarian UAV Network, which is really dedicated to promoting the safe, um, coordinated, and effective use of UAVs in, in humanitarian uh, settings. So the network itself has access to about 600 professional vetted. Uh, UAV pilots in 60 countries around the world. Do you want to just clarify? Oh, the sorry. UAV in yeah, case. sorry. Too much in my own head. UAVs are unmanned aerial vehicles, otherwise known as drones. But we're talking specifically about unarmed civilian uh, drones, uh, meaning remote control airplanes, helicopters, kind of things. Um, so. I'll give you a quick example of this in action and then describe the past three days. Uh, so a, a few months ago I was uh, invited by the World Bank to spearhead their UAV response to Cyclone Pam, which was a Category 5 cyclone in Vanuatu, high-end Category 5 devastated uh, islands. And the purpose in, of this mission was to basically carry out aerial surveys of affected areas in order to have those complement the field-based surveys that were car being carried on the ground. So it's not instead of the field-based surveys, but it's very much complementary so that we could do triangulation and, and some quality uh, control. So that's just to let you know that this is not science fiction. IOM has been using UAVs in Haiti since 2012. Uh, Medair has been using UAVs since 2013. And a number of the organizations that were in, involved in the three-day policy forum uh, this week from you know, UNHCR, the World Food Program, and others are actively exploring uh, this space as well. So it's not a science fiction hypothetical. We've already got some, um, some use cases. But the, what was interesting, and what has been interesting over the past year and a half, exploring this UAV space within the context of humanitarian action, is frankly how interested and receptive the vast majority of humanitarian organizations uh, I, that were that I, that I, that I approached. I, I really did not, ex I expected a lot more resistance, just like we all the resistance around crowdsourcing and crisis mapping in 2008 and 2009, I just expected the same kind of backlash. And more, at least three organizations that I remember now over the past six months when I've, exp I've, I've expressed my surprise at how interested and ready to engage they were, they, it was, I just blew my mind. They said, well, and all three of them said, large organizations said, well, we, we completely missed the boat when it came to the mobile technology revolution. Uh, cell phones and mobile phones. Completely missed the boat. We were complete, we were years and years behind on, in understanding or even being open to the possibility that smartphones, mobile phones might actually uh, be relevant in humanitarian context. We don't want to miss that boat again. And I find that really interesting because I mean, when was, um, does anybody know when SMS first came around? It was in the pub quiz last night. <laughs> 1990? 92. First 92, SMS. so 20. 20 years or so. So in 2012 was when the first code of conduct for the use of SMS and disaster response came out. 20 years after cell phones uh, came out. Tw two decades, the disaster, the humanitarian community goes, oh, we might need a little code of conduct because it seems like text messages are being used in disaster response. 20 years, right? Um, here we are, UAVs, consumer UAVs, micro UAVs are still very, very, very new. Frankly, the evidence base for the added value of UAVs is still very thin. Understandably, necessarily so. There's not been enough experimentation, enough use cases, and so on. And nevertheless, we had 22 people for three days around the room this week, from these ICRC included, willing to come down to the table and say, you know what? We do think that UAVs are going to play a fundamental role 
in the years and decades to come. In the meantime, we want to set up guidelines to inform the responsible, effective, and ethical use of these technologies because we do believe they are going to have an impact, they are going to play an important role, even though we don't have the evidence yet. And I find that forward-thinking attitude phenomenal and to be applauded and restores a lot of my faith in the humanitarian community. I mean, it was phenomenal how engaged these organizations were with these uh, 72 hours. And we've come out with an initial set of guidelines, first of all, a code of conduct on how to use these technologies responsibly, uh, ethically, focused on local communities, marginalized communities, and so on. Then we d took a deep, deeper dive on four key areas, four policy areas that were identified by these humanitarian organizations as, as being complete gaps right now in the humanitarian UAV space. The first one was guidelines and community engagement. How do you engage with local communities, disaster-affected communities, both in conflict zones and in terms of natural hazards and so on, in a way that's responsible, ethical, and, and so on, right? Um, so we've, we've got some initial guidelines, draft guidelines on that with consensus with these dozens of different humanitarian organizations. Then we looked at data ethics with respect to, to UAVs. And by the way, it's not all data collection. UAVs are also payload delivery, communication services, and so on. But data ethics, we've got some core guidelines. Now, of course, we didn't have to invent these guidelines uh, out of the blue. We really re much uh, um, uh, dependent on the ICRC's uh, data protection guidelines from the 2013 edition. That's why it was so critical to have ICRC in the room. We had a leading expert in Europe on surveillance and ethics and data collection who helped inform that. So we've got some initial core guidelines, again, but draft, first draft, yeah? Um, and also on uh, conflict zones, the, 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 the potential use of uh, UAVs in conflict zones. What, was I, what I found quite interesting as well was the conversation was no longer if they should be used. I think there was a realization that these are going to be used regardless of whether we like it or not. We have no control as to whether these technologies are going to be used or not. If they are going to be used and it's out of our control, then can we at least influence and provide some thought leadership on what to keep in mind, what the risks are of using these technologies in conflict zones. And the fourth area was um, principal partnerships uh, between UAV companies, UAV teams, UAV operators, and humanitarians. Two very different worlds with different incentives, different goals, and so on. And how do we create guidelines to inform Again, principled partnerships between these two bodies. So, and we've actually converged on the last day uh, on, on an initial set of draft guidelines, which are now going to be reviewed internally within these humanitarian organizations uh, for a certain period, and then going to be made public for open discussion, open input, broader community. And then I've had some encouraging initial conversations with two leading international donors in the humanitarian space, one of whom, without my asking or even suggesting, just said, what if we became a signatory? What if we publicly endorsed this code of conduct once you've completed this open deliberation uh, process? What do you think about that? And I was like, well, you just made my day. I mean, added a little teeth and so on. So I find this remarkable. Thin evidence-based, we understand there's potential, we understand there is considerable danger. Not even, if, even if we take disasters, not conflict zones, I mean, just the things that could go wrong. Um, and we're, 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 we've just spent 72 hours, 22 experts in the humanitarian community, drafting these guidelines. I mean, I think that's phenomenal. So. Great. Thanks very much, Patrick. And it's great to know that, yeah, there are things going on that do speak to the positive side um, and ways that the issues are already starting to be tackled, right? So let's build on it a bit more because, Tom, do you see these waves of, you know, interest from perhaps humanitarians, not necessarily on drones, for example, but... You know, is it a fetishization on these new waves of technology? And is it enough to look at the guidelines and do these, um, go through these processes and think about it critically? Is that enough or is there something else, even well, from history, that we can learn to better safeguard or what more could be done on top of um, these developments? Well, I, I think, I certainly think that the uh, idea of codes of conduct and ethical principles are extremely good and I think the kind of work that Alex has been doing at the Refugee Study Centre is an excellent start, it's a really good start, particularly because of the way that it pushes the element of participation and the human-centred side um, through particularly. Um, I found that story fascinating as well about drones. But from a historical perspective, I'm almost interested in the things that it's difficult 
to regulate. And in fact, one of the problems with these code of conduct is, of course, enforcement. It's making sure that they're enforced, it's making sure that they're, they're regulated. But I think that there are some broader structural changes which seem to be happening in the humanitarian industry when you look over the last 50 years or so, which for me are worrying, and I may be putting myself out there uh, in this room because you may not consider them to be worrying, but I think they're things that can't actually be safeguarded against at all because they're historical trends that are probably happening anyway. The first one is the increase in disconnect between the humanitarian worker and their beneficiary population. And I think this disconnect has been growing for a long time now. And having done some oral histories <coughs> with retired aid workers, they, they express um, uh, uh, again and again a feeling that aid workers have been retreating from the front line. And of course, it's in the academic literature, it's described as bunkerization very often. Um, what's interesting for me is also that there's this cycle of perceived risk, which then creates a greater risk, which then goes into the perceived risk and a greater risk. So that the more you feel there's a risk to aid workers, the more you bunkerize, you retreat into armored SUVs, you retreat behind high walls, but that makes you more of a target because then you appear like a military compound. And I think that has been a trend that's been going on for some time. And I find a lot of technology interesting because it's a, an example of that trend taking us further. I mean, drones is a, a good example for me. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's taking that disconnect between the aid worker and the beneficiary um, to another level. Um, and again, it, the question about whether we should be worried about it is one I hope we can debate. But for me, and I should say I come from very much a development background, it is a concern. I think the second interesting trend that's going on with humanitarian technology is the way very often they imagine a world without the state or beyond the state or, or, or post the state. Um, a lot of them are attractive precisely because they bypass state bureaucracies and because they offer a much more mobile, lightweight, personalised kind of aid. So the kind of example I'm thinking of is the life straw, you know, the straw that you use to suck dirty water through and then you get clean water at the end of it. And, and of course, you know, I can imagine that this thing has a lot of uses. Um, but it promises clean water without the infrastructure, without the state, without um, systems of sanitation, broader network systems of sanitation. Um, and something is also true of plumpy nuts, the, the silver sachets of peanut paste which we use for therapeutic malnutrition. Of course, the good thing about plumpy nut is it liberated therapeutic feeding from the clinic, um, getting around, it liberates people from systems and networks and bureaucracy and all the organisation of the clinic. And so it's very easy to see why it's a good thing, but for me I think it represents a shift in the humanitarian imagination from a vision of the state, which is the ultimate locus of benefits to society, um, and again, through my historical research, I found very clearly that older humanitarians always came back to the state and the welfare state as their ultimate ideal, to one where the vision has shifted to citizens who can exist without the state, when the state is unable to provide for them. Um, and I think that is an interesting shift. Um, there's an idealised notion of people with their own technologies of self-sufficiency. And if we look at all the policy buzzwords in humanitarianism over the last five years, they all reinforce this. It's uh, reliance, uh, resilience, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm probably in the minority again, but I find it worrying. I find it represents the end of a social democratic dream and the triumph of, ne of a neoliberal dream. Um, and I don't think that kind of thing can be so guarded against. And I probably also should admit that I'm probably fighting against a tide uh, in that respect. And then the third big change that I think we're seeing historically here is the entry of a particular kind of ideology, which has been described by some as the Californian ideology. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the idea of the Californian ideology born in Silicon Valley, um, a strange mishmash of new left and new right thinking. And I think um, uh, Richard Barbrook originally developed this idea and he described it as a, a combination of the freewheeling spirit of the hippies with the entrepreneurial zeal of the yuppies. Um, and it's also got dollops of Randian libertarianism in there as well. Um, and I, 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 maybe it's controversial, maybe it's not, but I think that humanitarian innovation partly emerges from this kind of thinking, this kind of ideology. Um, a lot of the themes like restlessness and the attacker's advantage and creative destruction and adapt or die, you know, these are very much in the spirit of those times. And I don't mind if I'm dismissed as a 20th century big state social democrat with lashings of Luddism thrown in, um, but I suppose I, I think that maybe there is an ideological struggle going on for the soul of the humanitarian community underneath all this. And that the kind of people who are attracted to humanitarianism in the past 
going right back to, you know, Henri Dunant, um, the Fabianism of Dorothy Buxton, who founded Save the Children, the, the kind of new left generation, first generation of MSF people in the 1960s and 70s. We can't detach humanitarianism from those kind of political visions. And I think we're seeing a new political vision here, which prioritizes the market over the state. And I'm probably not the only one who's worried about that. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. More challenges. Yes. Um, let's see. Um, if Pascal can offer some maybe practical ways that from an organisational perspective that you can start to engage with some of these issues and perhaps Patrick pointed to one of them where ICRC are already engaging on helping develop and think ahead and think for the future in terms of policies and um, using technology and innovation. I guess as a preamble you, you can't uh, uh, you know block uh, innovation and new technologies. We ha you, I mean, you have to, to live with them, you can. Uh, the, the problem is, is to uh, foresee the, uh, the positive and negative effects in, uh, um, on the long term. Nobody knew exactly uh, when the web was invented in Geneva a couple of years ago, uh, how it would change the way we, we work, or we communicate, we, we see the pro uh, different problems. But uh, uh, the thing is that we, we, we can try to regulate uh, technologies. It's what we have done with, uh, with the drones. It's certainly not perfect because we'll see new, uh, probably new uh, applications, uh, new forms of, of, of um, uh, deployment of drones uh, or, or UAVs. But we, we need to, to keep this moral compass. And, and I would say uh, having this humanistic uh, uh, um, <coughs> angle on, on innovation and not forgetting that we are dealing with you know, human beings uh, wh which not, cannot be re reduced to data. So, you know, there's kind of data worshipping sometimes. Uh, and we have many examples that people resist the data. You know, we had uh, in Yemen uh, a very interesting survey a couple of uh, months ago which showed that people who had no, almost no food, no water, uh, uh, and we are living in terrible conditions. Uh, put education of the children on the first as a, as a first priority. So they they were res resisting all models somehow. They they would trade uh, hygiene against education, and that's also a lesson for us of humility and uh, uh, <coughs> modesty that we we need to to uh, to keep a right balance between uh, te technological uh, uh, innovation and and uh, social. Uh, um, uh, assessment. Um, in terms of, of practical measures, we, we, we try to, to keep in, in, in RCRC something we call principled pragmatism. We, 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 uh, we need to improve uh, our, our different uh, uh, mod model of operations. We can use uh, uh, more sophisticated technologies or more relevant technologies, but still to have this kind of uh, uh, um, um, concern for our, our principle, we, we know uh, where we come from and what are the values we want to, to share and promote and this has to inform all the uh, you know, d discussions on, on innovation. Uh, and it's, a, it's quite an interesting uh, uh, setup now in SRC because we have an innovation cell. Uh, an, a cell which is working with a partnership with private sector, uh, trying to uh, foster new partnerships on in innovation, but as well the policy uh, unit, uh, policy cell, uh, and we work a lot together, we compare notes and we try to, uh, 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 you know, to get some incremental progress like that by exchanging different views, different angles and not uh, having, uh, I would say, so some kind of imperialistic uh, policy view or an imp imperialistic uh, technological view. Uh, for us, innovation is more a process than a program. It, it, uh, <coughs> so we, we, we try to create within the organization uh, a kind of conducive environment, a space for innovation, a bottom-up approach always. Uh, uh, we have, for, for example, created a red innovation platform where people can put uh, their challenges, their problems, and, uh, and share their concerns with colleagues, with peers, and see whether we have already something uh, on the shelf or we, can, uh, we have to uh, change uh, uh, our operating model or uh, invent uh, or <coughs> find new technologies. Uh, I think somebody uh, spoke about inclusivity. We, we need to uh, it's a question of relationship 
with beneficiaries. We need to include all the beneficiaries, even in the design of new technologies, and uh, to have something like a very strong contextualization. You know, you don't innovate in Afghanistan like you would innovate in Iraq. It's not the same culture, not the same people, not the same constraints. So this uh, 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 tension between standardization, industrialization of, of technologies, and strong uh, uh, contextualization should inform uh, all different uh, choice. Uh, of course, the, the do no harm uh, approach, which is for us in all domains, so, so it's not only with, uh, with uh, innovation, but we, we, it's all more or less in our DNA. DNA. It's the, probably the first lecture we do with our uh, uh, staff when they join us here, say it's the, the do no harm. Um, and to strike, for example, the right balance between the importance of the problem, the speed and the quality, we always have to, to do some arbitration within these three uh, notions uh, uh, because it's, it's quite important that we, we uh, uh, respond to the emergency, but at some point uh, we have to uh, think about the long-term effects, long-term relevancy of what we uh, produce, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a very difficult exercise, in fact. We, uh, but we, we try to do it as well. It's more aspirational than, than I would say real, but we, we try usually to adapt our innovations to the evolution of the situations. And situations are evolved, as I said, as well as our understanding of, of the problems. Um, we are building a quite, a quite robust ethical uh, framework uh, regarding the use of new technologies. Uh, uh, we do it in, in cooperation or in, in close connection with what, what uh, Alex is doing, UNICEF uh, and other uh, universities. Uh, I think it's important that at this stage where there are so many uncertainties about uh, technology innovation, we compare notes uh, and, and we don't do it in, in total isolation. Um, and this, the last point for us, and it's also very close to our identity, um, uh, we, we, we have to fight against complications, as we said, uh, uh, too much sophistication. You know, innovation should be simple, uh, simple, to, simple to deploy uh, and, and, and simple to use by uh, our, our staff or uh, by our uh, partners, uh, namely the uh, National uh, Red Cross and, and Red Christian Societies. So we need to, to have this kind of, of, of uh, frugal uh, innovation concern where we, we, we try to, uh, as much as possible, to avoid uh, unnecessary sophistication. Thank you so much, Pascal. Well, I think we've covered um, a lot in um, a short space of time. We still have probably around 15 minutes to continue the discussion with you all here. So let me turn to you. Um, and if you have a question, please raise your hand and our kind volunteer will come and bring you the microphone. OK. Any questions? Oh, there's one at the top. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Artish Gonzalez. Uh, I'm, I'm based out of Silicon Beach in, in, in California. Uh, so my question is around artificial intelligence and and the use of AI in in humanitarian work. So I just did buy Patrick's book as well on my Kindle here, and I do see you cover AI a bit in your book. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the use of machine learning on on predictive analysis on population movements or even how we plan operations. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on how AI and machine learning can be used effectively. Or do you see that waiting another 20 years before AI is also adapted by the humanitarian sector? Right. Thank you. If it's OK, we'll take a few questions and then turn to the panel to address all of them. So any other questions? One down here. Hi, I'm Francisca. I would like to know from you, what do you think it's the impact of border technology, especially in focus of um, or in focus on, on mega trends, which are trends lasting over decades? And what kind of impact does the border technology actually has on um, the humanitarian assistance? Thank you. Any more questions? One more up there. Oh, and one there. Let's take those two, and then we'll turn to the panel. Thank you. 
Hi, I wonder whether the panel could give a definition of technology, um, because some of the examples that, that have been given seems to be more science than technology, in my, my view. And uh, maybe you'd like to discuss GM as a kind of uh, science that was meant to transform humanitarian aid. Great, thank you. Like, last question over here, and then we'll take some answers. Uh, going along the lines of the point about the erosion of state involvement in, form in favor of the market, uh, I'm just curious about uh, what you would say about if it was the governments that invented the internet, how different it would look right now. Uh, every time I turn around when I see government involvement in the internet, it's clawing back freedoms that were created by the technologists. So I'm curious to know your, your take on that. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. So, we've got a question on AI, artificial intelligence in humanitarianism, megatrends, what that means in a broader sense for humanitarianism, our definitions of technology, and if the government could have designed the internet, what would it look like? So, Patrick, would you like to go first? And I'll give you both the opportunity to address um, one or all of the questions, as you wish. I'll just choose one. Um, <laughs> but thank you, those are really great, uh, very, very good questions. And uh, I guess I'll just take the first one. Um, so we often like to think in the humanitarian space that our problems are special and unique and we are special and unique, right? But this big data challenge, you can put that in quotes, you can, I know it's a buzzword, but the fact is there's more data than ever before and that's just reality. Call it whatever you want. In Manila, when I was at the UN OCHA office, they, uh, there was a big you know, blackboard and so on. People had written massive data. Massive data equals what doesn't fit in Excel. Um, so, humanitarians are struggling, and it's not me making it up. Um, people are, are struggling with this vast volume, velocity, and variety of information. Now, if you look at other sectors, uh, in the private sector and other industries and so on, how are they making sense of big data? They're turning to AI. They're turning to a combination of AI is, is machine computing and human computing, uh, i.e. crowdsourcing, microtasking. That is what Amazon and other type, top 500 fortune companies are using. They're using these scientific, we want to talk science or technology, scientific, core scientific methodologies from advanced computing, human and machine computing, in order to make sense of big data. That's how they're doing it, and that's how they've been doing it for a few years already. If we think our problems are that special and unique, then of course we're not going to think of those solutions as pertaining to, to our challenges. But um, one of the areas of work that I've been working on over the past couple years is really trying to bring th some of that know-how and um, expertise inside the humanitarian community. And in order to do so, I had to go all the way to Qatar, to the Advanced Computing uh, Research Institute in Qatar, because that expertise is there, and there is a will and mandate to leverage advanced computing for humanitarian applications. It's not in the UN, that expertise. It's nowhere close, right? Um, but that's where it is, and that's where people from Microsoft Research, Yahoo, Google, and so on, are scientists and engineers. And so it's, the question is, we don't have, we can either choose not to make sense of big data, which is people can choose to do that and ignore, ignore people's voices during disasters and not communicate in a two-way direction, or we can try and make sense of big data and actually partner with organizations um, that actually have that expertise. And so what we've been doing at QCRI is developing free and open source uh, platforms to make sense of so-called big data. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, ADER, AIDR, uh, applied to SMS. This is a formal partnership with UNICEF, where with the U-Report project, they're receiving tens of thousands of text messages in different countries. We're working directly with a UNICEF office in Zambia. Um, and what this ADER platform allows them to do is basically use artificial intelligence, real-time statistical machine learning, to automatically classify text messages. Because frankly, uh, 10,000 text messages a week, you don't have those kind of resources in that time to actually make sense of it. So we're using advanced computing. And it might sound like science fiction, but you can already say UNICEF is using artificial intelligence in a development context, and OCHA is using the same platform, but for social media in disaster response context. They're using artificial intelligence. It's already here. And by the way, we're extending that now, right? The, f the future is using AI to make sense of text, but also pictures. And Silicon Valley, Stanford startups have already done um, some really interesting work in, and there's been some fascinating breakthroughs in computer vision over the past 16 months where you can do automated feature detection uh, within pictures and videos as well. And um, yes, it's Big Brother, 
Big Brother is going to do what Big Brother is going to do, I still want that technology for humanitarian applications. So it can speed up uh, analysis, data collection, and hopefully uh, response. So there's no two ways about it. Either we make sense of big data and we use the scientific methodologies that have been proven, or we don't. Thanks, Patrick. Tom, would you like to pick up on some of the uh, questions? Yeah, I, th I think I'll pick up on the question about the state. And I see exactly what you're saying, but I wonder if you were misunderstanding the argument I was making, which is that there's been a shift in the vision of humanitarian as a sector away from the state. Um, there's one scholar called Mark Duffield who's envisaged this as a shift from a modernist conception of a disaster to a postmodernist conception of a disaster. And what he means by that is that disaster very much used to be conceived as an interruption to progress, um, a, a, a temporary state through which this linear path of states moving broadly towards the vision of a European society with a strong welfare state um, and a well-functioning government became replaced by a vision of disaster as something which is omnipresent, which is always there, which is always bound to uh, happen to people in vulnerable areas of the world. Um, and in that change, humanitarians stopped focusing on building up the state and started focusing on the idea of resilience and self-reliance. And he sees it as an abdication of their responsibility. He sees it as a relatively meagre vision, where instead of concentrating on building up bigger infrastructures, we concentrate on small, mobile, micro-technologies for individuals to get clean water or for individuals to do things. I mean, that may be a utopia for some of you, um, but for me, it's not a utopia. Um, and I think that's really probably a discussion that goes beyond the room. But that's what I was alluding to. Yeah. Thanks very much, Tom. Pascal? I've got a, a, bit less, a bit more pessimistic view uh, on, on, on this uh, issue of uh, global uh, say civil society. I think we, we are uh, observing a trend where s some states and, and uh, particularly new powers, new emerging, emerging powers are not ready to relinquish their sovereignty. They are extremely sensitive to that. Uh, <laughs> And they see, you know, any intrusion uh, on their territory, on the guise of uh, disaster um, uh, uh, relief, etc., as as an infringement of their on their own uh, sovereignty. So I think, uh, and they are extremely cautious uh, and suspicious about, you know, the use of new technologies because because they think it's part of, uh, would say, a global conspiracy uh, against them. I, I think that's also something. Uh, we have to, to factor because just ignoring sovereignty of these states may have uh, detrimental effects on, on humanitarian actors in, in the field and I don't want to, to quote specific states but I think we all know which, which ones are, are in, in question. And the second thing is that, is that uh, um, yeah, of course, the, you know, the, there's a circulation of new technology. You can't just uh, 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 bar the access uh, of technology to specific actors. But I think we should be careful not to, to transfer human technologies to the mi military circles. We are very, very sensitive to civil relations and the fact that you know, we complain when uh, ISAF use the same car as, as, we, as we do and we think we, we, we need to be distinct and uh, create separations. But so, at some point, there are some very, I would say, uh, strange relations between human actors and, and military research, which should be probably uh, uh, looked at and, 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 and analyzed. Because I think that's also a problem that uh, either uh, some uh, human actors are using military technologies, but also, I guess, and uh, we have some evidence on that, that military actors could benefit from technologies which have been developed by human uh, actors. And I don't think it's in line with our identity and, 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 and uh, uh, objective. So I think, yeah, well, it's a, we should not be paranoid on, on this issue, but we should look at it uh, from a scientific point of view. <coughs> Thank you very much, Pascal. <coughs> Would one of you like to very quickly address in a few words the definition of technology? I know there's a lot of literature on different ways that technology can be defined. Maybe, Tom, you could give a very brief I'm not sure if I was trouble, but I, I, I've <laughs> always thought of technology as putting science into practice, and I don't know if you were referring to some of the examples that I gave, particularly the protein hydrolysates and the, and the leaf protein concentrate, but I mean, I didn't go into them in a lot of detail, but there was a lot of technology, particularly associated with the leaf protein concentrate example, a whole loads of machinery w were designed in order to convert these grass and green leaves uh, into 
into a leaf protein concentrate design. And most of them were made in the UK and then exported to West Africa and India and Mexico where these projects were going. Um, and the, and the protein hydrolysates less because it was more of a medical procedure. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I like that science into practice and that's something that does happen in the world and it is going to happen and is happening in humanitarianism. So maybe I'd like to just wrap up there. Thank you very much for your questions and for listening. Um, I hope that you found it as engaging as I have and I'm sure you'll agree we could be here for hours and days debating these issues. But what perhaps needs to happen is thinking about the future. So we've really unpacked a lot of these challenges. What, what does transformative mean? We don't have a definition. What are the goals of using technology? If we define how we want to use it, that might make us think a bit more critically about how we can take technology as a tool, as a, a small part of our toolkit with policies and practices that need to go with that. So there is maybe hope for the future, even if we can't safeguard against um, ideological changes in the humanitarian space, but principles and ethics might offer some promise for the future fighting against our assumptions and partnering together um, with others, comparing notes, as you said, Pascal. So there are, there are opportunities to make the most of technology and I think we've all got a lot to learn. And thank you very much for a great discussion and we'll see how the discussion evolves in the next few years. So please welcome me in thanking the um, panel for a great discussion.